The Elements Massage brand believes massage therapists deserve a supportive team, business and marketing resources, linens, lotions, and the chance to learn as much as they want. So many Elements Massage studios offer continuing education too. What's better? They're hiring. To get your foot in the door, let them know we sent you by visiting elementsmassage.com slash ABMP. That's elementsmassage.com slash ABMP. As a massage therapist, you know that truly the world's most beautiful machine is in your hands. You help relieve the pain and pressures that hold your clients back from fully enjoying life. The CBD Clinic Massage Collection uses ingredients from nature to deliver strong, effective, temporary pain relief with aromatic botanicals and natural emollients like CBD. Our tiered pain products let you personalize your massage to meet each client's needs. Be your client's hero by giving them the massage treatment of their dreams with CBD Clinic. Learn more at cbdclinic.co. Welcome to the ABMP Podcast. My name is Darren Buford and I'm Editor-in-Chief of Massage and Body Work Magazine and Senior Director of Communications for ABMP. And I'm Kristen Coverly, Licensed Massage Therapist and ABMP's Director of Professional Education. And ABMP Podcast listeners, I am very excited to let you know that the ABMP CE Summit is coming up Tuesday and Wednesday, October 26th and 27th. We have over 20 presenters, six CE courses, tips from the pros, Everything you'd be interested in knowing about day one, upper body, day two, lower body. The event is free for ABMP members and just $99 for non-members. Learn more and grab your spot at abmp.com slash summit. Our guest today is Robin Anderson. Robin is the Regional Director of Education at Empower Education. She has been a board-certified licensed massage therapist for 15 years and currently practices in a plastic surgeon's office specializing in post-operative recovery care. She is also an NCBTMB-approved continuing education provider. Robin has a Master of Education degree in Adult Education and Training from Colorado State University and published research on ergonomics training methods for improving body mechanics and massage therapy students. Robin is a frequent presenter at many professional conferences specializing in the realms of adult education, teaching methods, and ergonomics. Robin is currently the president of the Massage Therapy Foundation. Hello, Robin. Hello, Kristen. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you um, having me on your show today. Well, we're so excited to have you here. Welcome to the ABMP podcast. Robin, let's start uh, by getting to know a little bit more about you. Can you tell us about how you first became interested in massage therapy and what motivated you to become active with the Massage Therapy Foundation? Well, it's funny you should ask me that because I have been active with the Massage Therapy Foundation ever since I was a student. So my first uh, interaction with the foundation was when I submitted a case report as a student, and I actually won a bronze level award in my student year. And then a year or two later, I submitted a practitioner case report and got an honorable mention. So it kind of has been ingrained in my, uh, my DNA, I guess, <laughs> as a massage therapist ever since the beginning. So as my practice went on, um, I looked for opportunities to volunteer, and I was invited to serve on the Community Service Grant Committee, as well as the Education Committee. And um, from there, you know, invited to be a trustee and then uh, vice president and now president. And I'm really happy to serve. It, it, it's really um, been an integral part of my massage practice over these years, as well as an educator. Robin, for listeners who may be unaware, can you tell us a little bit about the work that the Massage Therapy Foundation does? Yeah, absolutely. So our mission is pretty much, we have three areas that we focus on, uh, research, education, and community service. So our goal is to try to support those areas as best we can. We are a nonprofit organization. So our goal is to try to support the profession through helping to fund research projects, but also developing all different types of educational tools and resources, as well as giving back to the community, serving areas of the population who might be underserved or do not have access to massage. So that's what we try to do. We encompass ourselves in just doing so many um, of these core facets 
as practitioners. So Robin, you were recently elected to be president of the Massage Therapy Foundation, and I know your tenure is two is like a two-year term. What are your goals during that two-year term? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a loaded question. <laughs> well, well, first of all, I kind of felt like I had really big shoes to fill, knowing that, you know, I was following Doug Nelson, um, but also knowing previous past presidents such as Diana Thompson and Ruth Werner and Geraldine and Cambrin. And so for me, I wanted to be able to continue the legacy as well as all of these practitioners and colleagues and dear friends that I absolutely love. So it's been, uh, that's been a, a focus for me. Uh, there's a few initiatives we have going forth um, in this, these next, I guess, two years. Um, one is I wanted to be able to give back some educational tools or programs since I am an educator and, 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 you know, I have a master's degree in education. So that's kind of first and foremost, what I like to, you know, would like to contribute. Um, secondly is I, I've been involved in this ergonomics project. Um, I have a background in ergonomics. And so I've wanted to give that back to the profession as well as find other ways in which we can expand research for the profession. And we are doing that um, number one with the research agenda that was recently released, as well as our involvement with practice-based research networks, which is coming up in the coming months. So my hope is, is that all of those projects can be off and running by the time um, my two-year term is up, but maybe I'll stick around for a little while longer. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> So many exciting projects on the horizon. One that I'm really interested as a practitioner in learning more about is the ergonomics project that's front and center right now for the Massage Therapy Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit more about the project, uh, what it is, what are you studying, why did the Massage Therapy Foundation want to take this on as an objective, all the good things, everything about the project. Fill us in. So we as a, as a board, we talk about ways at which we can impact the profession. And one of the things that we noticed in the last couple of years, and I'm sure you all have noticed this just, you know, with your members and, you know, in a lot of the, um, in discussions with practitioners is that there's so many people leaving the profession. They don't have a lot of career longevity. And so, you know, being the inquisitive person that I am, um, that I almost wondered why is it that so many people are leaving? And one of the things that a lot of people noticed is that um, they really, we've not really done sort of a job task analysis of therapy work. And so this is where ergonomics comes in. I, I used to work as an ergonomics consultant. I also worked in a manufacturing plant where I practiced massage. And that's kind of where I got my introduction to ergonomics. And one of the things that these manufacturing plants like to see is that if there is a job task that needs to be adapted to the worker, then they want to do that to prevent musculoskeletal injuries. And so it started to get me thinking, well, you know, we always have these discussions in our conferences about well, what is considered full-time work for a practitioner. What is um, considered, you know, a, a reasonable, reasonable number of hours? And then you talk to different practitioners and they're like, well, I work out of this small space, but then others work in really big rooms. Some people use portable tables. Some people use hydraulic tables. They always ask about body mechanics and we teach body mechanics. But do we really know that any of these things are truly what are going to help us in career longevity? So, and that's one of the things that we have a hard time as massage therapists is taking ourselves out of the equation, letting someone else evaluate us. And so I brought this thought to um, the board and I said, what if we were to have ergonomists really take a look at how we do work in different practice settings and give us some real parameters for safe practice in the workplace, which involves a couple of different things. Ergonomics involves not only the health and safety of the worker, but also ease of task. It's, a, it's an art and a science. Hmm, very similar to massage therapy. <laughs> and, it, and we look for optimization, but not only from the biopsychosocial model, but also from work output. Because obviously, you know, the people who employ us and the people who run businesses for massage therapy want to know how they can optimize their bottom dollar in making a successful business. So this is why we decided to do this uh, type of, of project. Now, 
we decided that we wanted to fund the project ourselves. And part of the reason was because, again, we wanted to be able at the end of this project to be able to give it back to the profession, establish some best practices, establish some guidelines that's really based on professional work, professional evaluation of our work. So we we sought out the uh, professional help of Briotics Health, which was uh, an ergonomics uh, firm, and we asked them to help us sort of create the structure of a project. And I put together a workplace or a work team as sort of a committee with uh, the foundation. So my team is made up of practitioners, researchers, as well as educators. So Sandy Fritz, Ed Moore, who's done research in um, ergonomics for massage therapy about 10, 15 years ago. Uh, Dana, Dr. Dana Madigan, who's doing um, some research on total worker health model for massage therapy. Uh, Doug Nelson, of course, he was president at the time, so he was he wanted to be involved in this no matter what. Uh, Sabrina Lopez, who's a practitioner and an educator, and Brad Decker, who's also a practitioner, educator, um, and involved with a little bit of um, ergonomics. So, you know, all of us put together, we uh, helped to sort of guide this project. And our hope was, is that we'd be able to come up with some real guidelines for the profession. And we completed phase one last year. And we are excited to hope to move to phase two um, post-pandemic. So we had to kind of put things on hold because of the nature and structure of the project itself. Let's take a short break to hear a word from our sponsors. Anatomy Trains is delighted to announce a brand new dissection live stream specialty class on September 18th, Lumbo Pelvic Stability, a one-day layered dissection with Anatomy Trains author Tom Myers and master dissector Todd Garcia. The early bird price of $150 is held until September 10th. After September 10th, the price is $250. Come see the body's actual core for yourself. This course will be provided over Zoom webinar with multiple camera views, live chat, and Q&A. Visit anatomytrains.com to sign up. Now let's get back to the podcast. Robin, let me ask you a question. How are you collecting data and what individuals and massage therapists are involved? So with the phase one, what we did is we selected two cities um, in two different areas of the country. So one area we selected was Baltimore. So that's because that's where I'm from. <laughs> Made it easier for me to travel. Um, and plus, I knew uh, employers, schools, um, practitioners in the industry. So it made it really easy to, easy to recruit people to be studied um, and workplaces to be studied. Then we also looked for some people on the West Coast, and we selected Portland, Oregon as our second location. And again, we secured a school. We secured some volunteers who were practitioners as well as business owners, you know, practices. And we went to these two cities, and we did a, a few different things. We did some video recordings of practitioners that are actually doing massage in the same environment, so either using a portable table or a hydraulic table, but they all did the same thing in their city. The ergonomist would evaluate and observe them using a force matching tool. So they would see if, if, for example, if you were giving a certain amount of pressure on the back, the ergonomist would say, can you match that force that you're applying right now? And, and they would ask them to do that. They also use three different tools. One is called the uh, Rapid Entire Body Assessment, which is a REBA. If you know anything about ergon ergonomics, you know that that's a, a pretty common tool that's used in assessment. Um, a QEC, or Quick Exposure Checklist, and a Duet, or Distal Upper Extremity Tool, as well as taking some physical measurements, table heights, widths, room sizes. They did all of that type of stuff, not only just in the, in the section where we observed therapists, but then also in the businesses that we went and looked at. We looked at what types of tables they used, how, what their schedules were like, how many clients do they see a day, what type of work do they do, what tools do they use, how many breaks do they take, so forth and so on. So we did that in both cities, and the structure of kind of creating this model came from survey data that came from our website. We had over 700 massage therapists respond to this survey, which helped us sort of to figure out where are the common musculoskeletal issues that most massage therapists have, what concerns do they have, and they were all different ages too. So it wasn't just, you know, people who were new to the 
profession as well as people who've been in 20 plus years. So these 700 massage therapists gave us a wide range of what we could look for when we did this data collection. And it was really interesting to see the things that um, we learned in this phase one. And again, using the person, using an ergonomist to look at what we do as opposed to massage therapists looking at what we do, I thought was very eye-opening. Um, and the data was pretty cool, actually. <laughs> Robin, before we get to that data, can you tell me just a little bit, were all practitioners doing the same modality? No. And we did that because not all massage therapists do use the same modality. Now, we didn't allow them to do like Thai massage on the floor or anything like that. They did have to use a massage table. They could use whatever means that they wanted to in terms of addressing specific areas of the body. So everybody had to address the same areas. But in the same amount of time, they were all given 30 minutes, but we told them just be you. We wanted them to be as natural as possible because we wanted to see what they would normally do in their work environment. So if they did more myofascial work, they did more myofascial work. If they did more deep work, they did more deep work. Either way, we wanted to see how they executed it. That was the main concern, that regardless of what modality you used, we wanted to make sure that you were doing it effectively and with good body mechanics and good ergonomic aspects. Okay, let's get to that data. Robin, what are the results that you found in your phase one research? There were some major themes that, that came from sort of the overall work that we did in phase one. One is that it's definitely true that Massage therapy work is a moderate risk level job um, for developing repetitive stress injuries or musculoskeletal injuries if no self-care or intervention is used regularly. I mean, that seems like a pretty obvious statement, but in reality, it, it, it really needed to be said. Massage therapists also have long duty cycles. That, meaning that we spend the time we spend doing work is very long in relation to other professions. So therefore, when we have that, there is more opportunity for risk of injury. Uh, the massage work environment can also be prepared to effectively improve health and safety of the massage therapy worker. So we can definitely set up an environment that makes it safe in the workplace for a massage therapist. And then we managed to establish some recommendations that could be incorporated possibly into entry level or continuing education training. And we came up with, I guess it was about maybe eight things. So number one is that physical conditioning is definitely important for ideal career preparation. So we definitely need to be physically capable of being able to do this type of work. And understanding that that level of conditioning will depend on your ability to work in particular types of settings. Table height adjustments. So table height adjustments, I know we talk about this and we it's definitely taught in um, entry level programs. It's definitely taught in CE courses. So in other words, you know, maybe you've been taught in school that if your knuckles drag, that's about where you should be, you know, in terms of your table height. So, but actually kind of coming up with, and I believe that the ergonomist wanted to actually do measurement parameters that if you want, if you have a portable table and you're this height, then your table should be about this height as average. So we call that anthropometrics, which means that you uh, want to sort of create the average, but there's always going to be outliers. So for example, when Shaquille O'Neal goes to buy a car, he's clearly not going to fit in this average size car that you and I would fit in. So, um, but, so they have to customize for him, but when they build these cars on the, um, the assembly line, they, they build it to the masses of what would be the average. Well, you know, our equipment is going to be very similar in terms of that for massage therapists. So there might be some parameters in terms of what our table heights will be. And you might have to make some changes if you've got somebody who's a little bit smaller or a little bit taller. So table height adjustments, very important. Trunk positioning. One of the things that we have to be able to do is that our trunk should always be aligned with the direction of stroke for the best force application and minimal risk. So in other words, make your belly button point in the direction you're going and don't go anywhere else. And your flexion of your trunk should be no more than 20 degrees at a time. 
So we noticed in watching some of the therapists that a lot of them would go beyond 20 degrees. Well, that puts a lot of pressure on the lower to mid back. And so that's the reason why we don't want to recommend that. Using the stride stance frequently, that's another aspect that we need to do. Maybe it's underused. Um, and so we need to emphasize that more. Um, side of table positioning. That is a good ideal positioning whenever possible. And the reason being is because it generally brings you closer to the body part that you are trying to work on. I, I know that we teach um, for great flow to use the end of the table, especially when we're doing the back and so forth. However, we really don't want to do that that much. And you have to take that into account for your body. Um, I use myself as an example. I mean, I'm five foot three and I don't have a very long wingspan. So I call myself vertically challenged. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but basically speaking, whenever I do a longer excursion stroke on the back or the leg, I actually do more of a side straddle stroke because I literally can't go all the way down without really putting a lot of trunk flexion or a lot of overreach into my strokes. And so that's kind of some of the issues that we need to pay attention to. The other thing is also, I mentioned it just briefly, is stroke excursion. We want to try to avoid those longer strokes when possible and always stand our target area as close as possible. And we don't want to do that overreaching. So reaching across the midline, except for if you were doing like a contralateral stroke, that would be okay. But again, you want to be as close to that that body part as you possibly can. This may seem pretty obvious, but avoiding single digit force exposure. So in other words, those thumbs, if they're not supported, don't use them. If you, you know, if you also want to do um, fingers, again, they should always be supported. So you should support your digits at all times. And then last but not least, um, avoiding trunk and neck lateral flexion. So what do I mean by that is, well, we all are caring individuals, and I know I do this sometimes because I'm a parent, is doing the, oh, just tilt to the one side a little bit and just kind of just relax and just saying, oh, I'm taking care of my client. No, you can't do that. You've got to keep your head as straight as possible and try to uh, eliminate as much rotation. So those were some of the things that we um, we sort of initially came out of phase one, but we'd like to kind of figure out some more stuff. But this is a good foundation we thought to work from and, and to um, to give as part of um, the results of our phase one project. These are absolutely incredible tips, not just good tips. They're incredible. And I can't honestly <laughs> wait for my next session so I can practice my alignment, do all the things. Like I really am excited to you know, make sure that I'm following all of these suggestions with my next client. Thank you so much for this. This is going to change the way a lot of people work and the way a lot of people feel and how long they're able to work. Thank you, Robin. Yeah, well, that's what we're hoping. Uh, and we are putting together a white paper that will be available on the foundation's website. We also plan on doing some um, sort of tips, um, video tips, some quick things to kind of show you um, what proper positioning is or physical conditioning. Um, the, the ergonomist gave us some, some good things to work from. And so we'd like to be able to use those as resources. And again, I don't want to just emphasize entry-level schools in terms of training. I would like to see CE providers, you know, incorporating this into their, um, into their education just because, hey, us people who've been out of school for a lot of years need just as much help and maybe refinement as the ones who are going through um, entry-level education. So, you know, we hope that these things, which should be out by the end of the year, we're in, we're in the development processes right now, but we should have all of these things available by the end of the year. And then, God willing, we are going to hope to go into phase two next year. Robin, this is perfect. Tell us about phase two. Yeah. So phase two, we're really excited about trying to go into phase two. One of the reasons that we're, we're excited about this is because we're going to be able to use wearable sensor technology. So what is that exactly? Well, ergonomists have these tools that you can actually put them strapped to your body and it can literally get a cumulative musculoskeletal fatigue reading 
on an individual that is doing a normal work duty cycle. So as a massage therapist goes through their work day, they, it, it will show how risky tasks might be um, pinpointed. So for example, maybe if you do four massages in a row, that your first massage, you know how we say your first massage of the day should always be as good as your last massage of the day? Well, this, this tool will be able to tell you whether or not you actually do that. It helps to determine what safe parameters are for full-time work. It helps to define the duty cycle. It can also pinpoint variables in physical conditioning, environment, as well as clientele will be factored into that. So for each massage therapist that wears this wearable sensor, they will have to sort of give us some background as to what their practice is like, what they do, and they wear it for basically about a week. So, but part of the reason why we didn't go into phase two is because of the pandemic. We wanted to make sure that we could recruit as many therapists as possible who were working in what would be normally full-time or regular work conditions. And since with COVID, many of us were shut down for a period of time or abbreviated practice or whatever the case may be, we decided that we would wait to do this until things were back to normal. So this phase two, um, we're hoping to do next year. Uh, we will be recruiting people um, to want to be a part of this all over the country. Um, so it's, it's a big expense too. So we have to do a little fundraising to kind of get the money to sort of pay for phase two, just to kind of slide that in there. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, we are a nonprofit foundation, so just saying. <laughs> Absolutely. And I am going to interject here, listeners and practitioners out there. If you've never been to the Massage Therapy Foundation's website, please go. It's a wealth of resources. They do so much for our profession. So please give massagetherapyfoundation.org a visit because it's important for you to know what they're doing on your behalf out there. Robin, I just want to thank you and the foundation for everything that you're doing. And listeners, please visit the website. There's a wealth of information there. And Robin, I'm assuming as you progress further further in the ergonomics project, you're going to be updating that material on the website so people can check in. Is that right? Yes, that's right. So the phase one uh, report information we will be releasing by the end of the year, um, and it will be available on the website. There's also, uh, if you go under research and go under the current projects, there is a whole page on the ergonomics project that's there. And so we will be updating that page. We've recorded a couple of research purchases already. I actually brought on one of the lead ergonomists who did some of the work and it, that one's actually active right now. But also um, the ergonomist who's gonna be taking care of our wearable technology when we finally do it. Uh, we did a, um, a podcast with that as well. So all of that information will be up on the website as well as the white paper once it's finished and the resources for tips and um, guidelines and so forth. We will have that all there. That's terrific. I want to thank our guest today, Robin Anderson. Listeners, find out more information about Robin and the Massage Therapy Foundation's work at massagetherapyfoundation.org. Thanks, Robin. And thanks, Kristen. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Members are loving ABMP 5-Minute Muscles and ABMP Pocket Pathology, two quick reference web apps included with ABMP membership. ABMP 5-Minute Muscles delivers muscle-specific palpation and technique videos plus origins, insertions, and actions for the 83 muscles most commonly addressed by body workers. ABMP Pocket Pathology, created in conjunction with Ruth Werner, puts key information for nearly 200 common pathologies at your fingertips and provides the knowledge you need to help you make informed treatment decisions. Start learning today. ABMP members log in at abmp.com and look for the links in the featured benefits section of your member homepage. Not a member? Learn about these exciting member benefits at abmp.com slash more.